I think for a couple of things. First off, it wants to, you, should, you should think about Spectrum as to which carriers you're going to be aligned with. And if you're going to go out and trade Spectrum or buy Spectrum or sell Spectrum, what are the things that drive it? More and more we find that industry consolidation, not any of the physical characteristics of the Spectrum itself, drives, drives Spectrum pricing. By and large, when Spectrum goes into one of the bigger guys, it's a black hole, it's never coming out. It's very difficult to get Spectrum out of those guys. Um, but on the other hand, you have all these other type factors that focus into Spectrum valuation. And I guess as an example of this is that a lot of people look at that and say, oh, you've got Spectrum, you've got 700, you've got the best of all worlds. Well, not exactly. Suppose that you're a CDMA carrier and you have a block spectrum for 700. This is the blocks, these are the band plans, okay? So you have a device that works, you're operating in this band, so your device is band class 12, and your problem is, is that you don't really have a major uh, carrier that would support you in this endeavor. Even if you were a GSM carrier, AT&T doesn't own any 700A block licenses, so all their devices are going to be built just for band class 17. So where do you go to get end user devices here? Uh, this is a huge problem. Um, this is probably what we're looking at um, to advise our clients with in terms of, you know, what carrier to align yourselves up. Again, we can come back to band class four, or AWS, as being sort of the ubiquitous um, band plan that all carriers are sort of defaulting to. You would, you should care about this for a couple of reasons. First. Although I would never at this point suggest building a network for roaming traffic, it is a component and you want to catch as much roaming traffic as you can. If you stake yourself down to a specific um, uh, you know, 700 megahertz um, area, either the A or B block, you might have trouble, or you would have trouble getting any type of traffic out of Verizon, for example. Um, the other thing is the development of the ecosystem. Uh, we, we, as a group, the smaller carriers are just not strong enough financially and have the market presence to be able to go out and order specialty equipment. And that's what the bigger companies are, are looking at, you know, even orders under a million as being specialty items. You have to go to, I want to say, off-brand Israeli providers, you know, some uh, Chinese carriers. I mean, these guys are making equipment that works, but a, you have to turn around and market that equipment to compete against the stuff that's being advertised on TV, by, against the Apple products, against a lot of the, um, the Android products, and it's a real serious issue for these guys. Um, on the other thing, and we kind of went through an example of why it's so difficult for CDMA, but when you think about Verizon launching their network on the upper C band of 700, and Sprint focusing either on the EMSR spectrum or on the Clearwire spectrum to use its uh, 4G play, uh, there's no room left really for where CDMA, small CDMA carriers go. I mean, you have to look to your next biggest guy as being uh, Metro PCS to be able to develop the equipment for you. So, um, and do they collectively with Leap and, and US Cellular have the, the clout to be able to order top tier devices? Certainly an open question. Strategically, when we look at Spectrum, this is what we think. Uh, the bigger carriers have all invested literally billions of dollars both in uh, spectrum and infrastructure. And they are all relying on data, not voice, data, to be able to support their, this investment. Um, and there, we'll get to a couple of examples of what some of these guys are doing, but it is more than giving a ta folks a tablet. It's more than giving them a modem card. It's a completely different business model that this network is going to support. Um, what we're seeing is a lack of buyers, particularly for 1900 spectrum, um, where people say, you know, this spectrum just doesn't interest me anymore, and uh, 
there's some stuff out there that frankly is not sellable. So just because you have spectrum doesn't mean that it's infinitely valuable or our people are dying to get their hands on it, even in a spectrum constrained world. Like anything else, it's where the hot spots are. Um, it's also helpful, I think, for us as a group to take yourselves out of the mindset of, I'm trying to buy something for me, to put myself in the mindset of my suppliers. Who is supplying me with this equipment? What is their motivation? Is there enough demand out there collectively from all the rural areas combined to be able to really drive any type of purchasing decision? Um, that's tough. And so how do you compete with that? We went to the uh, GSMA conference in Barcelona this year. And you know, voice was almost like a, a dirty word. You never heard anybody talk about voice. Instead, they're talking about having um, medicine dispensers that are tied into an LTE network. So you can monitor, patients can monitor their drug usage, or actually the physicians can monitor the drug usage of patients. Supposedly, this is, is like a $5 billion problem in the United States. John Deere, every single tractor that's being shipped this year is being hooked up wirelessly to um, the dealership. BMW, same way. If your car, your car is going to know when it's getting ready to have some sort of failure. It will communicate to that information to the dealership. The dealership will call you saying, it's highly likely that you'll experience a problem with your brake systems, your pads are worn, you probably should come in now. I mean, it's a little freaky when you start thinking about it, but uh, no freakier than actually implementing our uh, medical devices inside of the patient to be able to do on-time monitoring so they don't even need to call in. The device calls in or links up to the network from inside the body. That's, that's freaky. But anyway, these are the business models that people are basing the LTE network on, which is substantially different from the voice model. So you need to be as flexible and as open as you possibly can. And um, so whenever you have the opportunity to offload some of your operational responsibility, I would certainly um, jump at it. Again, no surprise, each owning about a third of the share of the market, AT&T um, and Verizon are going to set the wireless agenda. I've long said that it's not so much that AT&T have so much, it's that T-Mobile and Sprint have so little in the terms of strategic vision. We have such weak third and fourth carriers in the United States that we are effectively in a, a duopoly today, despite any actions the FC, DOJ might take against AT&T and T-Mobile. Um, again, you know, the growth is going to come and AT&T and Verizon are going to set that and that's likely to be through data and all sorts of new, interesting and unusual data items. Um, the question that we have as rural carriers is how can you position yourself to take advantage of the holes in those networks to be able to um, address those needs. Um, finally, we're seeing, just like the LTE rollout, the product life cycle is starting to shrink more and more and more. So, um, you know, these phones are now coming out with, you know, every 14 months, and the improvements in the phones are absolutely amazing. When you think about <coughs> Apple has already out, I forgot, the, it was over a million pre-orders within the first 24 hours of a device. That's an absolute amazing turnover, not only of devices, but potentially of carriers as well. So I think the opportunities are out there. I think it's going to be up to us to be able to have adequate spectrum and technology to be able to support them. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, right. Uh, Metro PCS, they're, they're one of the few trying to do LTE in 1900. Is there anybody else? Put it, put it, all the networks are going to be LTE at some point. And I think when you look at that map that showed they only have 10 megahertz, that's one of the reasons why they, they elected to, to do it at uh, the 1900 level. So um, I would suspect that you see more and more refarming of existing um, networks to be able to uh, to get there, and frankly, 
they couldn't get the spectrum they wanted in the spot they wanted to be able to do it other than 1900. They're, so, yes, Andy. Um, you gave a good background on the competitive landscape, and you sort of see the niche markets for, for Leap and Metro, and they have their niche. U.S. Cellular always seems to be kind of that unusual carrier out there. They don't seem to ever be leading from a technology standpoint, and their markets are close. Right. Where, where, I mean, from your perspective, where do they go? Well, um, when you basically have one family that owns, that controls the whole thing, they're not going anywhere until the family decides. Uh, they are, they're, they got started from independent telephone companies, and their route is customer service, and they will provide you service, and that's what they want to do. And they have um, really no interest in expanding their markets. Um, they're just focused on giving you a good quality experience. And, you know, they've done a fairly good job, but I mean, they, they really honestly don't have the devices to compete against the bigger carriers, and that's been, and, and the second part is, they've also been a house divided because they can't really decide, should I focus on the rural markets where the bigger carriers haven't? And I think that seems to be a corporate mission. And then all of a sudden what ends up happening is they say, your goal is to get 200,000 new net ads. And so they're for, forced to go to Chicago and St. Louis and try to grab share. So, I don't know if there's a question back here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was thinking about Metro. Are there are they building LTE on top of their CDMA so they have a handbag plan, or is it remove and replace? Well, I think I think a little bit of That's both. Tough with, with, huh? That's tough in 10 megahertz. Well, they, they have 10 megahertz of AWS. They do have one 700 megahertz A block market. That's in Boston, um, but they haven't done anything with that. But I think they would like to go ahead and build the AWS markets first, but. If they don't have that opportunity, they'll they'll start with 1900. And so, how did they get a deal with the handset makers? The, well, first off, you have to figure out who their customer base is, and the customer base probably is not as brand sensitive as Postpay, so it probably works well for them. Yes, sir. You know, some of the apps that you talk about are low bandwidth apps. Mm-hmm. And then you have high bandwidth apps. Do you see that the market is going to go down the path where all the high bandwidth apps will move to the LTE and the existing networks be used exclusively for low bandwidth apps? Do you see that sort of happening in the market? I think it's going to depend on the device, if it's an IP dependent, IP driven device or, or not. Um, one of the big things that came out in Barcelona was the concept of burst or thirst. You know, is it is it an app that needs a lot of information really quickly, or does it need a, a long drink? And how that how your network is built to handle those types of devices, and when, when that information is transferred. One of the things that's interesting is AT and T does not have a standard pricing model when they go out and recruit people like Walgreens and, and CVS or John Deere to run apps on their, on their particular mar on their network. Every deal is cut individually. I don't know how long that can last, but that's the method that they're going about today. And I think a little bit is to your question how they plan on addressing that. It's all on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, their end to end pricing, for example, <coughs> some of the stuff I've seen is it's five bucks a megabyte. I, I have no idea, for example, what they're charging John Deere. Well, great. Thank you all. Thank you.